Welcome to this special episode. The ties between India and Canada remain tense and there are no signs of a diplomatic de-escalation yet. Canada has not really shown any intention of cracking down on Khalistani extremists in their country. India has made it very, very clear that they need to see action to work with Canada and perhaps get along with Canada. We have a special guest joining us uh, on the telecast who will speak on the diplomatic standoff, the growing Khalistani movement in Canada and of course the Kanishka bombings. Mr. Ujjal Dosanj is the first person of Indian origin to hold the highest state office in Canada. In 1985, he survived a major attack with nearly 100 stitches on his head and he has minced no words in addressing the Khalistani issue. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, with you. What I want to know from you is I'm going to ask you a very generic question to begin with, then we get into specifics. What do you make of the standoff that's taking place between India and Canada? Why did it take for a Prime Minister to speak such, uh, you know, ill words against India for this kind of an escalation to come about? Well, the public knowledge um, is that there was a story about to be um, breaking on the front pages of the newspapers about this issue. Um, and obviously the Prime Minister felt that he had to get ahead of the issue rather than seeing it in the newspapers. Um, now one can argue that um, it would have been less damaging to the relationship if the newspaper story had said what he said, um, but uh, he didn't have to say that on his own. Um, so I think that it's true. Uh, in fact, he's damaged himself as the most important locator, interlocutor on behalf of Canada. Um, he can perhaps no longer negotiate with India on this issue because of that, uh, at least in the eyes of India. Um, and I think that, um, but the Prime Minister said something. He's the Prime Minister of my country. And if he felt, uh, it was important for him to get ahead of the issue. Um, but what's more damaging, I think, from my perspective, and many Canadians are feeling the same, that had he had the opportunity to give some more meat on this issue, uh, either publicly or at least privately to, confidentially to India, uh, that perhaps his um, allegations would have had a lot more credibility mm. and uh, the relationship would not have been damaged as much. Right, and, and so, you know, the problem that India actually has with Canada is there are elements sitting in Canada who want to dismember us, but Canada, uh, you know, has been supporting these elements, has been quiet against them uh, under the name of freedom of speech. That's exactly what bothers us. In fact, Dr. S.J. Shankar, the External Affairs Minister, just went about uh, speaking in one of the seminars. He said that freedom of expression does not extend to incitement of violence uh, in another country. Now, you have, uh, you know, uh, suffered at the hands, if I can say it that, at the hands of the Khalistani yourselves. What do you make of this situation? And you've also been a loyal citizen of Canada. What do you make of this, this, this problem or this, you know, stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea type of scenario for Canada? Um, I think that, that um, it is important to remember um, that Freedom of expression is a fundamental value. I think India has the same and Canada has the same. India is a democracy, perhaps a bit faultier than Canadian democracy, but a democracy nonetheless. Uh, and I think it's important for people to remember um, that Canadian law doesn't allow freedom of expression to incite violence either. You can't incite hatred or violence against people using freedom of expression. Um, the difficulty has been I believe that Canadians never really understood the issue of Khalistan. Um, they only came to terms or began to come to terms with the issue when Kanishka um, terrorism happened, uh, killing over 200 Canadians in fact, brown, right. brown Canadians but Canadians nonetheless. Um, over 70 children yes, in that flight. Many yeah. of them. And um, and but. You know, I have, what I have said, and I think Canadian politicians are at fault in this regard, that when they know that this particular section of people, Khalistanis, are trying to dismember a friendly country, 
they shouldn't take refuge under the freedom of expression to abstain from saying anything. In fact, they have an obligation, if you believe India is your friend and India is a democracy, uh, then you have an obligation as the political leaders of the country to say to people, hey folks, um, you have the right to ask for Khalistan, uh, but we don't support you standing up here, one, creating violence, two, trying to dismember a friendly country. We don't like that. Um, but nobody has said that, and no Canadian politician has said that, and that's partly because, you know, there are enough supporters of Khalistan, maybe three to five percent amongst the Sikhs, mm. um, and in several pockets across the country, uh, uh, you know, five percent can make a difference between winning and losing a seat. And uh, perhaps that's the reason that they haven't, they have been taking refuge under the rubric of freedom of expression, which I believe is, uh, is not appropriate. Mm. Do you think that, uh, you know, the Khalistani movement has uh, the deepest roots in Canada? Uh, you know, there are elements in other parts of the world as well in Australia and UK, you know, we keep hearing about it. We're, 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 we're in that, uh, uh, you know, look out uh, for, for, for information which comes about wherever the Indian diaspora is and where Khalistani movement is taking root. But do you think that Canada has had this special environment or this unique environment or rather this dysfunctional environment whereby which the Khalistani movement has been able to grow and the leaders of the day and the past have not been able to contain it? Well, and that is true. Canada, in fact, has a burgeoning Khalistani movement right now. Um, it had disappeared uh, for a long while and then it has resurfaced. Now, why it has resurfaced is a good question. I, I can't really add to your knowledge uh, um, or enlighten you on that uh, any more than you already are. Um, but the difficulty, I think, partly has been that in Canada, the politicians have been remiss, perhaps more than in any other country, in not intervening on this issue and saying to Canadians, who want Khalistan in India to say, look, please don't dismember a friendly country. We believe in the unity and integrity of India. Um, you know, I have actually said many times now in the recent times on television in, in Canada uh, that Canadian politicians should imagine were there um, several hundred thousand Quebecois living in Delhi and uh, trying to, you know, crash the uh, Canadian High Commission or Canadian Consulate and uh, trying to break up Canada sitting here, how would we as Canadians feel um, mm. if the government of India didn't condemn it? Correct. Uh, and I think that that's the problem Canadian politicians have. Uh, I believe, um, you know, Sikhs, Khalistanis, have the right to ask for Khalistan. Even Indian Supreme Court has said that you have the right to ask for Khalistan, but you don't have the right to um, violently dismember a country mm. or uh, create hatred and violence within communities. And I think that's where politicians need to draw the line. Mm. So there's also this organic comparison between Justin Trudeau and his father, Pierre, who was the prime minister himself for a lot of days. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, when the Kanishka crash, crash happened, his father was at the helm of affairs. How do you compare these two? You've, 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 you've seen both of these. Well, when Kanishka happened, uh, it wasn't his father. His father um, uh, had been dethroned, <laughs> mm. <laughs> if I can use that word. He'd been defeated. It was Brian Mulroney, the conservative prime minister at that right. time. And uh, the Canadian politicians were quite ignorant of the situation. Uh, so much so that uh, Brian Mulroney at that time picked up the phone and called uh, um, Rajiv Gandhi to control the deaths of Indians, and vast majority of them were <laughs> Canadians. Canadians. <laughs> so, um, you know, I had been assaulted several months earlier, um, and I wrote letters to all the attorneys general in the country and the Attorney General of Canada, um, expressing um, my fear that if the government of Canada didn't do anything, there would be uh, possibly murders in Canada. Lo and behold, Air India happened. And I think it was that moment that Canadian uh, security agencies, the Canadian police and others began to work on this issue, but it was already too late. Correct. And they were given intel about it 
uh, you, you know, before this crash happened, there were chances, they had opportunities uh, for something like this to not happen. What did you make of the Kanishka crash? Do you think that, okay, let's forget about the fact that it could be prevented, it could be prevented, but the fact of the matter is that there were a number of suspects, uh, you know, who were rounded up after the crash happened, but still, because of shoddy evidence or some technicality, they were let go. Well, Canadian police bungled the investigation. Hmm. They, in fact, uh, were following some of these characters uh, they followed them into a forest, uh, forested area on Vancouver Island near Victoria, and um, and in fact, when the uh, they were experimenting with explosions, when the explosion happened, they thought it was some ceremonial thing Sikhs were doing, and they discontinued the um, the they discontinued following them, mm. and uh, and didn't follow the if if they had continued to surveil them, uh, they may have been able to catch them. But they stopped the surveillance, mm. and then Kanishka happened. Correct. Um, and so I think, and then they erased many of the tapes, right, uh, containing wiretap evidence. Uh, it was an error on their part, but they did it. So mm. they bungled the investigation entirely. Once they understood the issue, then the investigation was actually uh, resumed. It res it started again. And I was the Attorney General when I actually went to Ottawa to ask for more money for the investigation and the prosecution. Um, and, uh, and it was given. And the prosecution subsequently happened and uh, the judge didn't believe that there was enough evidence to convict. That doesn't mean those that were accused didn't do it. It's just that Canada didn't have enough evidence to, uh, to convict them. Mm. There was a journalist too by the name of Hire who in fact uh, you know, did write about this. He was ready to testify that you know, he heard two gentlemen speaking on planning the Kanishka, but uh, there were attempts on his life in 1988, and then eventually he was killed in 1998, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that, that was uh, yeah. not a lead that they took seriously. Yeah, Tarahir, you know, I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but he was part of the problem initially. Okay. Um, and, and, and there was a fallout, there was a falling out between them over some money between Parmar and him, and he was writing ill words about somebody's mother, so the mother's son, hmm. um, attacked him and tried to kill him. That was the first time. Um, I knew Tarahir because he was a student of my father's uh, <laughs> back in India. Um, but after he was um, paralyzed, after the first shooting, he turned around and became an anti-Khalistani mm. uh, and was, uh, had heard, overheard the evidence um, overheard some in conversation in London that yeah. happened between Mr. Bagri and somebody else. True. And he was prepared to testify for that. And he was killed because of that. Mm. And, um, and no one has been uh, convicted of, uh, charged, prosecuted or convicted of uh, his death mm. either. Mm. So getting back to, you know, this, this point of, uh, you know, friction between India and Canada, uh, do you think that, uh, you know, there are channels, there are respective diplomatic channels, and there are several agencies which could have done their job in, you know, creating this pressure on India to cooperate rather than the Prime Minister going onto the floor and firing a diplomat, and India had to retaliate that uh, in kind. Do you think there were other options that Canada could have exercised, or do you think this was a knee jerk reaction of Mr. Justin Trudeau to the G20? Oh, I, I don't think that it was a knee jerk reaction to the snub. Mm. Uh, I, I, I hope the Prime Minister of Canada, I'm a citizen of Canada, I hope the Prime Minister of Canada doesn't be, behave internationally or diplomatically based on whether or not he personally was snubbed. Mm. Um, I think that, that it is believed uh, in Canada that uh, he tried to get ahead of the issue because it was going to be breaking in the newspapers and on television. Mm. Um, but I think that um, there were other ways of dealing with it. He could have had the Minister of Foreign Affairs do the same thing. It would have had been less high profile. Correct. Um, he didn't have to, the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs could have been, could have spoken at a press conference or at a newser rather than in the parliament. Because when you, when you stand alone in parliament and everybody's silent, it's, it's a very somber message. It's a very serious message. And I think that that kind of, uh, um, uh, catapulted this issue uh, to the highest possible level, mm. creating a situation where I think there is a bit of a standoff mm. uh, between Canada and India. And uh, Canada says we've given India 
uh, the, the substance of the allegations and India says that uh, no evidence has been given to us. Mm. Uh, in fact, the Canadian political leaders who have been briefed by the Prime Minister, uh, they say that in fact he's given us nothing more than what he's given publicly. And mm. he hasn't given much publicly. It would have been better from my point of view as a Canadian and as an Indian by heritage, it would have been better if he was going to make a statement that he had placed some evidence, if not before Parliament of Canada, at least handed some to the Indian authorities so that uh, his message could um, have been less provocative because more the, you know, the, the higher the level of evidence, right. the less aggravating it is if you say something. So what about Jagmeet Singh? Uh, we all know that he's a Khalistani. Does his presence and his proximity to Justin Trudeau make Justin Trudeau more of a Khalistani or he was always like that to begin with? Well, Justin Trudeau, the impression that, that, that I have and others have that he's been surrounded by Khalistanis right from the moment of his leadership. Mm -hmm. in, in his leadership campaign, there were a lot of Khalistanis. And uh, so he... Um, uh, you know, has been surrounded by them. He's influenced by them, obviously. Um, and, you know, there may have been domestic political considerations in the timing of the statement that he made. Although I don't believe that that's the case, but there may have been. Who am I to know what was in his mind when he was speaking? Um, I think Jagmeet Singh uh, propping up the government creates a perception problem, particularly for Indians. I already know that uh, Khalis... Jagmeet Singh, if not a Khalistani by himself, has Khalistani sympathies. Um, you know, I knew uh, a documentary or a, or a video that went around, uh, was making the rounds um, when he was running for leadership of the NDP, uh, where he was speaking at a Sikh sovereignty conference, somewhere in, in a place where other speakers had British accents. So I'm assuming it was somewhere in Britain. We, we've gotten the best from you and of you. Thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Thank you so much. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.